Good day and great health. This is Dr. Jericho Sarko of Ohio Specific Chiropractic. I'm a pediatric, family wellness, and upper cervical specific chiropractor. Today on this video, we're going to talk about the connection between ear infections and the upper cervical spine. Now, although chiropractic does not treat any disease directly, such as ear infections, our main goal is to improve the integrity of the nervous system at the brainstem level. When we do this, we can allow a better functioning and expression of our nervous system, which equates with better health and well-being. Now, to, as always, to kind of delve deeper into the connection between ear infections and upper, the upper cervical spine, let's do a simple crash course in anatomy and physiology. First, we're going to focus on the four main structures of the upper cervical spine. First, we have the foramen magnum, found on the occipital bone. Next down, we have the atlas bone, or the first cervical vertebra. Next down, we have the axis bone, or the second cervical vertebra. And in the middle here, we have the brainstem. Now, the brainstem leaves the skull from the foramen magnum, and it's going to be housed and protected by these two top bones of our neck, the atlas and axis vertebral bones. Now, along with those four main structures, we're going to focus on five specific nerve groups. The first group is the trigeminal nerve, or the cranial nerve 5. It supplies function to the ear canal muscles. Next down we have the facial nerve, or cranial nerve 7. It supplies functional information to the middle ear. Next down we have the glossopharyngeal nerve, or cranial nerve 9. It supplies function to the middle ear canal, throat, and eardrum. Next down we have cranial nerve 10, or the vagus nerve. It supplies a uh, function to a wide array of different uh, organs, glands, and tissues of the body, but we're going to focus on its connection to the outer ear, the ear canal, the eustachian tube, the lungs, the heart, and the overall gastrointestinal system. And finally we have the C1 and C2 spinal nerves. C1 nerve comes out off the brainstem in between the occiput and the atlas, and then the C2 Spinal nerve comes off the brainstem between the atlas and the axis vertebral bones. There's going to be branches from those two nerves that are going to communicate directly with these four uh, specific cranial nerves that we are focusing on. Now, what is the job or the main purpose of the nerves and the brain system? I'm sorry, the brain stem. They are both part of what we generally call the nerve system. Now, what's the job or the, the function of the nerve system? Well, it does four main things for our body. It controls all the movements we make. It senses everything we feel. It regulates all our body organs, glands, and tissues. And it relates us to the outside world. Now, nerves themselves, they can get stressed. When nerves get stressed, it creates tension on the nerves and puts an imbalance into the system. This then is going to affect the sensitivity perception, and behavior of the nerves affected. There are three general types of stresses that affect uh, the nerves and our body system overall. They are physical, chemical, and emotional in nature. A few examples of physical stresses that might affect a toddler uh, can come from when they are developing new motor skills or patterns, you know, going from the process of learning to crawl, walk, run, use their body in new, in new ways, it's going to create some trials and tribulations in that process. On the flip side of that coin, um, more and more we're seeing a restriction or a lack of motor patterns developing, uh, which is also causing a different set of physical stresses and traumas to the body. Some examples of chemical stresses that might affect toddlers, uh, they can have different food allergies or intolerances. Uh, some of the big players are usually dairy, wheat, corn, eggs, uh, but then also a big thing in our food supply, we're seeing a larger increase in different artificial and synthetic uh, ingredients, which is are also, also creating a lot of different uh, chemical disruptions and imbalances in the body. And finally, some examples of emotional stress. Uh, toddlers, this is, might be their first um, time away from mom or dad for long periods of time as they go to daycares. Uh, so they can have a little bit of that uh, separation, separation and anxiety, uh, and also maybe some negligence on the part of their daycare provider, maybe not giving them the love and support and, and needs that uh, maybe mom and dad would only give to them. Now it's the job of our brainstem 
to adapt all these stresses that are affecting our body and to bring the body back into balance and ease tension off the nerves. Now, depending on the quality and quantity of stresses that are affecting the body, the brainstem might not be able to adapt to them fully. Now, if the, if the brainstem cannot adapt to them, it's going to create some type of abnormal compensation. One specific type of abnormal compensation that we deal with as chiropractors is a vertebral subluxation. The vertebral subluxation is a physical presentation of a abnormal compensation. A vertebral subluxation is going to create body imbalance and nerve tension. Now, if we go to our drawing here in the middle, I drew in an example of a vertebral subluxation of the first uh, cervical vertebra or the atlas bone and how it compensates over to the right and it's going to create a body imbalance and nerve tension on any and all nerves affected by that vertebral subluxation. In this case, it's, we can see that it's creating a disruption in the nerves of the trigeminal, facial, glossopharyngeal, vagus, and the C1, C2 spinal nerves. This disruption to, the, to those nerves is going to create abnormal sensitivity, perception, and behavior in their functional capability. One example of um, abnormal sensitivity, perception, and behavior in nerves can uh, correlate with symptoms of the body. If we focus on ear infections, some of the more common um, symptoms of ear infections are sharp, dull, throbby ear pain, uh, maybe a constant cough, runny nose, uh, they can run a fever, uh, have some ear pressure or fluid buildup, uh, may, might also have a decrease uh, in the sense of hearing, uh, maybe then an overall sense of nausea and vomiting. Now if we look at these symptoms, we can see that they correlate uh, very closely with these uh, especially these four major cranial nerves that we focus on. Um, all the trigeminal, facial, uh, glossopharyngeal, and vagus all have some functional information or input going in to the ear in some way, shape, or form. Now, what is the major medical model or approach to treating ear infections? Uh, for the most part, it usually involves some type of antibiotic. But they've actually done studies that show, first off, that um, Ear infections, from a medical standpoint, are actually uh, more or less over-diagnosed. They've done studies to show that really over one-third of all medical diagnosed uh, ear infections can be misdiagnosed, which is going to then lead to maybe an un unnecessary use of antibiotics. Because what happens when, when the um, child is given a, a dose of antibiotics, it might in fact kill whatever bacteria or infection that is happening in the body, but what it does is actually then lowers the resistance of the body, which then you can see after that round of antibiotics, more often than not, that child will then be hit by another round of ear infections. That's because their body was compromised, which then allowed a new bacteria or new infection to come to the body and create um, some more damage to the body. So then after that first round, more often than not, what happens is then another round of antibiotics is used that then compromises the system, creating an influx of new potential infections. And that sort of vicious cycle happens maybe four, five, six times before then the medical doctor will stop prescribing the antibiotics, but then will recommend a surgery to put tubes in the ear to uh, sort of permanently drain the ear artificially. The tube surgery itself then has some side effects. It can create scar tissue on the ear canal, and it can actually then cause uh, deficits in the ability to hear learning, um, later in life. Now, what's the chiropractic approach to ear infections? Like, a, like everything we do, we don't look at um, individual symptoms. We look at one singular cause, and that's the vertebral subluxation. We say, what is causing these symptoms? Well, more or less, it's some type of abnormal sensitivity, perception, and behavior of the nerves. What's causing that? Some type of body imbalance and nerve tension. What's causing that? A vertebral subluxation. So to uh, remove the vertebral subluxation, we perform a specific adjustment to correct that. We then reduce the vertebral subluxation. When we reduce the vertebral subluxation, we reduce abnormal compensation 
and we improve the uh, adaptation quality of the body. When we improve the adaptability of the body, we improve the overall functioning and capability of the neurological system, which equates again with better health and well-being. If you have any more questions or concerns about how chiropractic is, can help with ear infections, please reach out to me at ohiospecific.com. Thank you very much.